Well, hi everyone, thanks uh, Jan and Alessandro for bringing us all together. I'm pretty tight on time, so I'm going to cut straight to it and get with the chronological whiplash and go through to the Middle Hellenic to Late Hellenic one in Central Greece. Um, we know comparatively little about the early second millennium Middle Hellenic society on the Greek mainland. The prevailing view is that it appears to have been fairly egalitarian with little material evidence for social differentiation. Now, rather than simply due to an inherent poverty, Joseph Moran has argued that the Middle Hellenic period was characterized by a social value system that put a limit on individual conspicuous consumption and any displays of material wealth. Early Middle Hellenic societies seem to be more concerned with what he calls group-related altruistic qualities like hospitality and domestic virtues, which put an emphasis on a collective communal or kin-based identity rather than on individuals. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the mortuary realm, where, even in wealthy burials on the mainland, such as at Varana in Attica, or the earlier burials in Grave Circle B at Marcini, grave goods are limited to mostly spindle walls and drinking vessels. This social norm, as we all know, began to change relatively quickly at the end of the Middle Hellenic and during Late Hellenic I, where some individuals began to differentiate themselves from their respective societies through ostentatious displays of material wealth. As Sophia Futsaki has argued, this led to a breakdown in the relatively undifferentiated Middle Hellenic social fabric and the implementation of a clear hierarchical system grounded in processes of gift exchange, conspicuous consumption, and competition. Now, this shift has mostly been documented in mortuary contexts in the Peloponnese or Attica. Unfortunately, due to a lack of stratified material remains, contemporary central Greece has remained poorly understood, both in mortuary and settlement contexts. While important Middle Hellenic and Late Hellenic I assemblages from inland settlements like Orkomenos, Eutresis, and Thebes are known, the material from these sites has been inconsistently published, comes from unstratified contexts, and has not been quantified to examine trends. The recently excavated pottery from Mitru in East Locris provides a stratigraphically secure and fully quantified data set from a settlement context, which adds a crucial dimension to these patterns of development. Mitru's location on the northern Euboean Gulf is also important as it, is on, as it is on key maritime and terrestrial routes facilitating north-south interaction. My analysis of the Mitru Middle Hellenic pottery has resulted in a seven-phase subdivision of the period and clear synchronisms with other stratified MH sequences on the mainland. Salvatore Vitali and I have also developed a four-phase LH1 pottery sequence. As the only stratigraphically secure assemblage in all of central Greece to span the entirety of the Middle Hellenic and LH1 periods, this combined sequence allows an unprecedented level of relative dating accuracy. Aletus van der has used this LH1 sequence to describe complex reorganization, the emergence of social stratification, and a clear elite at Mitru. This process must have required a complete realignment of the underlying social value system, impacting all aspects of life. In this paper, I argue that the origins for these changes can actually be found much earlier in the Middle Hellenic period. Trends in MH interregional interaction are crucial for understanding the networks of communication that catalyze this process, gradually overturning and replacing previous social values and allowing a new Central Greek LH1 elite identity to emerge. Pottery production and consumption practices during the first half of the Middle Hellenic period at Mitru were relatively consistent. The majority of fine pottery belonged to the so-called Grey Minion pottery class with a limited morphology entirely of open eating and drinking vessels. Vessel sizes were typically very large, with the average diameter of the smallest drinking shape, the cantharos, being at about uh, 17 centimeters and regularly up to 20 centimeters. Along with their high-swung strap handles, this may have facilitated easy passing between participants. These large vessels suggest communal eating and drinking practices using common vessels. Painted pottery is rare and ex exclusively employs red iron-based dull pigments painted in simple rectilinear motifs limited to cl large closed shapes or utilitarian uh, basins. This type of painted pottery is dominant for much of the Middle Hellenic period until the final Middle Hellenic phase. In, uh, in Mitru MH Phase 4, these practices were challenged for the first time, paralleled by a change in interregional interactions. Key connections were established with powerful centers like Agirini on Kea and Colonna on Egina. These connections became more frequent through the remainder of the Middle Hellenic period, peaking in MH Phase 7, where that, when they constitute more than 10% of the total pottery assemblage. I have here some photos of the macroscopic fabric groups, which were the key criteria for identifying these possible imports at Mitru. 
um, along, of course, with other technical and stylistic features. But if anyone wants to give me money for petrographic analysis, I'd love to. I'd love to. I'd love to get involved. Thanks. Uh, a similar range of likely imported pottery can be observed at other Middle Hellenic Central Greek sites. Calliope Sari has highlighted clear agonitan pottery at Okomenos and other Central <coughs> Greek sites, alongside some likely Cayenne yellow slipped. Goldman presents some probable agonitan pottery from Eutresis amongst her matte painted class. Furthermore, her red burnished and black burnished classes contain shapes we now know to be cycladic in origin, particularly cycladic goblets and bowls, including a magnificent bright red cycladic goblet with direct parallels at Agirini on Kea. Regular interregional interaction through what appears to be a Kayan centric network must have significantly altered the worldview of those within Middle Helladic Central Greece. It likely provided new opportunities in an emerging economy, promoted the communication of ideas, and transmitted new social values. An introduction which would have profound impact seems to have been the concept of status display through conspicuous consumption. From Richu MH Phase 4 onwards, the previously ubiquitous red dull painted pottery was joined by locally produced black manganese based matte painted pottery, which becomes dominant at the end of the Middle Hellenic period. Matte paint is a consistent feature of the contemporary ceramic assemblages from Agina and the Cyclades, and its first appearance at Michu in exactly the same phase as an increase in interregional interaction suggests that this technique may have also been imported. From Mitri MH Phase 5 onwards, small eating and drinking vessels are occasionally decorated for the first time, with increasingly complex matte painted motifs. Though I should acknowledge that the matte painted motifs on the Middle Hellenic pottery are still pretty basic, they, they're basically just rectilinear. Um, this decorated drinking pottery allowed more customization and differentiation. Furthermore, there is a 20% decrease over time in the diameter of cantharo rooms, and vessels overall have significantly smaller volumes. These smaller vessels in late middle hellatic phases indicate smaller portions, and the handle on drinking cantharoi virtually ceased to be high swung by LH1 when the shape evolves into the well known LH1 goblet. All of these shifts are consistent with an overall change in drinking practices towards smaller group or individual consumption where differentiation was important. The appearance of a subgroup of locally produced map painted pottery in the last phase of the middle hellatic period reinforces the idea that these shifts were connected to various interregional connections. While the best described examples come from Mitru, similar pottery has been identified at other late Middle Hellenic contexts in Central Greece, including by Tobias Kraf at Eretria and at Agia Paraskevi, and possibly also at Medeon, Okomenos, Thebes, and Eutresis, according to descriptions from Calliope Sari. This subgroup appears to show agonitan like characteristics. Agonitan decorative syntax and motifs, most commonly hanging layer triangles and wavy lines, appear on small open shapes, jars, and more specialized shapes, such as barrel jars and basket handle jars. These latter shapes are without precedent at Mitru, uh, but are well attested at Colonna. All of these vessels have been coated with a pale wash, making the pinkish central Greek clay appear closer to the paler agonitan clay. Along with direct agonitan imports, this agonitanizing pottery uh, suggests that an agonitan aesthetic had become a clear source of social capital in central Greece by the end of the Middle Hellenic period. This production and importation was likely facilitated by the position of Colonna as the dominant economic and political power associated with the central mainland at the time. Individuals likely aimed to symbolically connect themselves to the center of power to compete for status in their own communities. New patterns of practice were recontextualized, emphasizing the display of material wealth and exotica, eventually replacing the general middle Hellenic egalitarian ethos with an acceptance of elite individuals who could openly display their elevated status through material means. Such a shift in social attitudes would have provided an environment which encouraged competition and rapidly increasing inequality, precisely what is visible in the subsequent LH1 archaeological record. However, some important questions remain. If Cayenne pottery represented the clear majority of non-local pottery at Mitru throughout the latter half of the Middle Hellenic period and was clearly the key external connection, why are Agonitan aesthetics imitated? Equally curious is that at the beginning of LH1, at precisely the time a political elite becomes clearly visible in the material record, there is a drastic drop in the percentage of imported pottery. Why does this happen at precisely the point where the display of exotica and an emphasis on external connections should have been so important? I propose that the answer to these questions may lie partially in a changing socio-economic seascape in the Western String Cycladic Islands. The late MH2 and early MH3 period sees a peak in the Central Greek and Cayenne interactive network. But as has been argued by many, and most recently by Natalie Abel, 
Aguirini on Kea begins to come under significant Cretan influence by Aguirini phases 5 and 6. This period is precisely when Cayenne pottery all but disappears at the, in the Mitru and wider Central Greek record, and it also coincides with a drastic drop in the presence of Central Greek imports on Kea. If Aguirini and his presumed control over the valuable mineral resources at nearby Lavrion in southern Africa had reorientated itself primarily to, towards a Cretan network, this would have dramatically impacted the networks of interregional interaction up the Euboean Gulf. The new social value system now in place in central Greece allowed inequality to be expressed, and the consumption of rare exotica was a primary way to do so. But the changes in the south may have made the acquisition of such exotica from known centers of economic power like Colonna much more difficult. It seems possible that there was a genuine economic and political divide at this time, with competing networks of influence identifiable through the distribution of Aganeton and Cretan material culture and respective imitation phenomena. The Cretan network extended to the western Cyclades and the southern Peloponnese, while an Aganeton network, though initially embracing Cretan MH2, later extended around the Saronic Gulf into the Argolid and north into central Greece. While these spheres may have overlapped or interacted with each other in some places, especially the Argolid, they are generally operated in distinct arenas during this period. For example, in all the Middle Hellenic and LH1 assemblages of Central Greece, I know of only a handful of genuine Cretan imports that have ever been identified. Similarly, very few genuine Aganeton or Central Greek imports have ever come to light on Crete, uh, uh, at least as far as I know, uh, despite this period being one of the first great eras of, eras of interaction in the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, near the end of the Middle Hellenic period, elites in Central Greece may have made a conscious determination to reorientate themselves away from Caia towards Colonna, an equally interconnected competitor with whom they were already familiar. However, with the Euboean Gulf largely cut off due to Caia's strategic control over its access, new routes of reliable interaction between Agina and Central Greece may have been required. As Donna Krigo originally proposed in 2010, one of these routes may have run overland or across the isthmus near MH Karaku and up through the Corinthian Gulf, a route which, as Yulia and Dan has shown on Thursday, played a crucial role in facilitating interaction in the subsequent Late Bronze Age. If correct, this new network cut out the elites on the Euboean Gulf, who now found themselves on the periphery of a reorientated network of interaction. Some exotica may have still been available, such as those filtered through the interest central Greek exchange networks, possible heirlooms, or acquired through northern connections, but the remaining demand may have been fulfilled through the local imitation of agony and pottery. But this was unlikely to be sustainable or as effective, and new strategies to express status and identity were probably required. In this context, by LH1, there seems to have been a need to be to, uh, for a re-emergence of material culture which emphasizes uniquely central Greek stylistic characteristics. And I, I believe an example of this is the appearance of the well-known mainland polychrome or Boeotian bichrome pottery at the beginning of LH1. As an aesthetic product with distinctive manufacturing techniques and decorative syntax, the class stands out as a high quality product in contrast to contemporary painted traditions elsewhere. Boeotian bichrome may have filled, uh, partially filled a need to locally reinforce a new Central Greek elite identity, identity within its own right. Furthermore, Fundamortal has demonstrated important changes at Mitru in LH1 settlement organization, building practices, and public architecture, which also acted as local symbolic representations of the new Central Greek elite identity. Most, most importantly, in the late MH and, uh, and LH1, uh, the built chamber tomb begins to appear, new examples of which have recently been excavated at both Mitru and Elion in Boeotia. As discussed by Nikos Papadimitriou, these tombs are the monumental burial type of choice for emerging Central Greek elites, but they bear little relation to the contemporary shaft grave culture in the Argolid or on Aegina, apart from a broad repertoire of burial goods adhering to a so-called warrior identity. Seen in the context of the development over the previous centuries, I argue in agreement with Fundamortal that Boeotian bichrome, together with Central Greek built chamber tombs, evidence for light horse-drawn chariotry, and the appearance of a central organizing authority in both the settlement and mortuary realms emerged out of a need to articulate a locally defined central Greek elite ideology of power that went beyond mere conspicuous consumption of increasingly hard to acquire exotica from the south. In spite of the long-standing connections between central Greece, Caia and Agina through much of the Middle Hellenic period, the new central Greek elite identity in fact needed to be independent of southern centers of power. By early LH1, the levels of inequality within Central Greece had risen to a point where status could be predominantly expressed using a locally defined repertoire of symbols, performance, practice, and material consumption. What it meant to be an elite in Central Greece, and how that status could be communicated, had changed dramatically from the early Middle Hellenic period. 
a new social order had emerged based on a new value system. While interregional interaction had played a role in catalyzing this process, ultimately, LH1 Central Greek elite identity had to be locally defined and negotiated due to uneven interregional connections and shifting networks. Thank you very much. Thank you.